So I want to welcome everyone in. Uh, super grateful to have you. Uh, this has been something that I've been uh, dreaming about for quite some time, just having uh, the opportunity to take our church and help us to be a little bit more equipped so that we can study the Bible uh, with individuals on our way, you know, going through life. All of us should have the ability to take someone uh, from uh, the beginning of the studies all the way to baptism. I really believe that. We should we should be able to do that. I'm going to go ahead and pin myself there. So you should actually have my, my screen as the biggest one now. Um, because we're all called to be fishers of men. You know, uh, when right before Jesus leaves this earth, uh, you know, uh, until he comes back and, and that day our job will be done. Um, his expectation is that we go and make disciples of all nations and that we carry that burden um, that he had and he hands that off to us. And that is not for leaders. That's not for certain people that are, you know, well-versed in the scriptures. That's for every single individual that calls themselves a Christian. And we all need to have those convictions that if we call ourselves a Christian, if we're a disciple of Jesus, then we should be able to help someone to become a disciple. And uh, so just uh, very early on in my walk, um, I don't know if it was just the time that we were uh, becoming Christians, uh, you know, in the in the mid '90s, but it was something that we were uh, we we were we were proficient at helping people to become Christians. We were great teammates. If someone was leading the study, uh, we were pretty quick to be able to be a great support to fill in the gaps of certain parts of a study if it was left out on accident by someone who was leading the study. We were we were just, we were good at helping people to understand the scriptures. And, um, and, you know, we didn't have modern technology like we have today, but I do remember being taught how to study the Bible. I would go along with someone, uh, they would, um, uh, you know, lead the Bible study, encourage me to take notes as I'm taking notes. Uh, you know, you hand those notes over to the person that you're studying the Bible with. And then later you'd have a discussion. Hey, you know, what'd you learn? How, you know, what, what did you think about, you know, how that Bible study went? And we would discuss it and we would be, be get better and better at, at studying the Bible uh, with individuals. Um, this is not to toot my own horn in, in, in any way, shape or form. But one of my favorite things to do, uh, I would rather study the Bible with someone than do anything else. Uh, I, I love watching someone's eyes light up when they see the scriptures for the first time or they make the connection for the first time and they finally understand what the scriptures are, 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 are calling them to do. And it is one of the more encouraging things that I have on to do on the planet. And uh, I've, we've, I've been a disciple for since uh, June 11th, 1996. Uh, and um, since then, I've been studying the Bible with people that, you know, every year, uh, pretty consistently fruitful. I've probably helped over 50 individuals become Christians. And a lot of you guys that are on uh, this call, um, you know, I've been a part of your Bible studies. And uh, so the studies that we're going to go through today, they're, they're the basic studies. I mean, I know that there's lots of study series out there, um, but these are, these are just group, groupings of scriptures that methodically take us from seeking God you know, and what does that look like to seek God or have a heart to want to have a relationship with God all the way to, are you ready to be baptized? Um, and, and I believe that, uh, these, these verses are, are extremely efficient. Um, there are lots of other verses that we could pull into these Bible studies. So they're not, it, it's not like these, this Bible study is, is to create widgets, um, and, and to, to turn someone magically into a disciple, it's to soften the heart. Um, these Bible, these, these verses are to captivate the heart, to get the attention of someone who is seeking God and to show them what God expects of them through the scriptures on what it means to become a Christian and what it looks like to become a Christian, what the Bible expects of someone as they become a Christian or disciple of Jesus. So, 
Um, you know, again, there's, there's lots of study series out there. I just, you know, the, these study series I've used time and time again, uh, we're not here to talk theology or, you know, which study, you know, which Bible series is better than the other. Uh, this is just a group of, of Bible studies that I've been using for years, uh, to help people to become Christians and, um, and they work. So I believe in these Bible verses and, uh, hopefully, uh, as we go through these this time, uh, you will gain a new hunger, a new desire, a new passion uh, to wield these scriptures uh, like a sword, you know, an expert uh, to to help someone to go from very low knowledge of the scriptures, maybe some type of past with church, possibly an atheist or an agnostic, all the way to helping them to get into the water um, of baptism. So. So yeah, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to start um, with the study Seeking God. Uh, you know, if, if you're looking for these studies, all you have to do is go to our main page. And if you go to the bottom, uh, there's this little maroon button uh, that that says uh, First Principles. And you click on that First Principles and it will take you to a box network, B-O-X and what Box has is got all the studies listed out there for you. So if you're ever, hey, I, I don't know where the studies are at, just open up your wireless device, go to the main web, the, our website, swflcoc.org, and then go to the bottom, click on First Principles, and they'll open right up for you. You can print them there, you can download them and keep them forever, uh, you know, on your on your wireless device. I've got them all kind of just in my phone, uh, in my files, that way I can just bring them out and print one for someone. If I'm studying the Bible with them, I can just print it out for them. Uh, there's no secrets. These aren't secret, you know, you have secret knowledge and, you know, special cosmic ability. No, it's just a set of verses that are explained to help someone's heart to be changed. Um, it's very important as we get started that these these Bible studies are not, you know, they're, they're, they're not um, designed to in themselves to walk someone through the Bible studies is not the end game. Uh, the, the goal is that these verses help someone's heart to connect with God. So there, there are other verses that you may feel that need to be used in the middle of a Bible study because you see someone that they, they might be a little confused. They don't fully understand the point. So it, it's not like, hey, if we didn't get through all these scriptures, they haven't become a Christian. That that No, we use these studies to help someone to, to get the heart, uh, to help them to, to connect with God, to have a relationship with with Jesus. I mean, that, that's the goal. So understand like just getting someone through the, 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 the study series is not the goal. You know, the goal is to help them to have a relationship with God, a longstanding forever eternal relationship with God. So we don't want to just go through the studies and if they don't fully understand them, we just kind of move on. No, we want to make sure that they understand completely, uh, what they're, what we're going through. And, you know, and, and, and it's important that, there's a big connection that you make as you go through these Bible studies with the person that you're studying the Bible with. So it's it's super important. Uh, another thing is that these studies are linked. So I, I've heard a lot, you know, and, and it's happened in our own congregation, and I'm not pointing fingers because I don't remember who it is, but I've, you know, just the talk of the town sometimes is that, well, they're already seeking God. So we went ahead and went to the word study. Um, that that actually uh, does not benefit you whatsoever because to show someone th what the Bible expects of them to seek God will help you to use what you've built in the Seeking God study to convict their heart through the word study. And when you go into the word study and you pull out these scriptures and the expectation of someone needing to be a Berean and having a deep uh, understanding of the scriptures that they, in the, in the, 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 the word of God is the authority. Um, then the, th then you see that, wait a second, when I go into the discipleship study and when it gets very challenging, you say, Hey, look, it's not between you and I, the, you know, you go back to the word study and you sit and you can show this person that the, the Bible is their authority. 
and that they said that they would make the Bible their authority. I know this is hard, but this is what the scriptures are calling them to do and so on. So, and even the discipleship study, you know, when you go through the discipleship study and you see what the Bible teaches, uh, what a Christian is, as you move on from the discipleship study into, and we're going to talk about this in the future, whether it be the cross uh, or you move them into the darkness study, uh, that will help you. So then, then you could also go reach all the way back to the beginning of your Bible studies when you did the Seeking God study, and you can use those scriptures as you move forward even into those other Bible studies like the light study. I mean, it's it's amazing uh, when as you, if you build it right, if you build someone's heart right, uh, the foundation that will be built within the series uh, will be something that will be unshakable. And I'm telling you, all of us can probably look back and we can say, you know, we can see some of those that we are, that we have a relationship with right now within the church or outside of the church now. Uh, we can see where some of the cracks in the foundation were. And a lot of those cracks were because they didn't fully understand something within the Bible studies or the person who was studying with them kind of skipped over some things and didn't make sure that they had a deep conviction before they moved on. Uh, so it's very important that as we go through these Bible studies that we, we don't just kind of jump around and kind of, you know, uh, use our own judgment. We let the scriptures talk, let the scriptures judge, uh, let, let the scriptures do the work. And, uh, you know, and I've said it a ton of times, we're just beggars. You know what I mean? Like we're not, we don't have power. You know, we don't have abilities. That all comes from God. All we're doing is showing people where the bread is at. So that also puts us in the right place as well. We're nothing special. All we know how to do is get around the Bible. So we can show someone what the Bible says about their lives. So we show someone what God thinks about them so that they can make a healthy decision. Uh, a decision that has been counting the cost. A decision that, uh, you know, will, will methodically help them to make make it all the way uh to be with our father in heaven so that that's the goal right i mean we want to see people save not knowledge this is not an academic exercise you know gain more knowledge and get better at no it's it's not it it's we want to become better at helping people to become christians uh and what i love about uh you know with the way that paul and peter and a lot of the examples that we have in the bible a lot of times the, the, the more humble we are and the less polished we are, the, the, the more connection we're able to have with someone's heart. So it's not about academic exercise, not about getting into these theological discussions. It's helping someone's heart to connect with God. So, amen. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to say a prayer um, and we're going to we're going to we're going to color the background and then we're going to jump in. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much uh, just for your word. Thank you that you don't uh, just expect us to wing it or to figure it out on our own. You give us so much direction and you give us so much uh, of your heart uh, that you expect us not only to uh, transfer to someone, but you expect us to do the best that we can. And in and, and, and times like this, uh, I just pray that they will, this time will help us. Uh, it will uh, equip us. It will give us the tools that we need. Uh, to, to be not only better at studying the Bible with someone, uh, but that we will be more passionate, um, that we will be more excited and eager, uh, and, and we will see uh, fruit in our own personal life uh, through this because of this time. Um, we look forward to seeing your hand work uh, through these Bible studies that as you equip us, uh, we will look forward uh, to passing uh, this on. We love you. Uh, be with me right now. Um, it's always awkward on Zoom. <laughs> uh, it's not a real Bible study. We know that a lot of this stuff uh, that we're going to be going through uh, is uh, is for us to be equipped. And I just pray that all of us will really be able to connect. And, um, and I just pray that I'm not uh, going to be in the way of that. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, let's go ahead and grab our Bibles. And we're going to go over to uh, Acts chapter 17. Now, um, a couple things that I concentrate, and remember, a lot of the, what I'm going to share is just what I do, okay? I don't necessarily focus on what makes me comfortable. Um, I think a little bit more about the person that I'm studying the Bible with. 
you know, uh, you know, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's someone that you met at the gym, maybe it's someone that you bumped into, you know, at the supermarket, uh, whatever that may be, uh, that, you know, the way that you met them, maybe it's a family member. Um, it's, we, uh, as individuals want to help that person to feel comfortable and in a setting that they would be able to accept the word of God. Some people feel super comfortable in a Starbucks. I've studied the Bible in a Starbucks and it was like, chaos, but it ended up being more like white noise and it helped us to focus and they didn't feel so, you know, like secluded. Some people I've studied with in my office and it's quiet and it's just, you know, we're in this, this space and they're able to laser beam focus, but you've got to think about, you've got to use your own judgment. What would be best for this person? Not necessarily what's best for you, because if we look and see where Jesus went, to reach out. He went everywhere. He met people where they were at. And that's really what our focus should be is that I just want to get this person in an environment where they feel comfortable and they feel secure. Uh, sometimes just go on their turf, go to their house if they feel comfortable there, go to their job and sit in their office if they feel comfortable there. That's fine. You know, it's not going to change our Bible study any, you know what I mean? It's These are verses. We're going to walk through the verses. We're going to talk about the points and uh, and whatever makes them feel more comfortable the better. Second little hint, and you might want to just kind of file this. Um, what I do is when I get a new Bible, uh, the first thing that I do is I go to, I go through the Bible studies, especially the first three, and I, I just map them out in my Bible. I go to the first verse and I circle the verse number. And right before that, I write down what the study is. If it's seeking God, I just put SG. Seeking God. And that's the first one. Then I go into the front of my Bible and I write down, or in the back of my Bible, I guess I did it on this one. Yep. And I write down all of the first verses in each study. So that way I have a little map in my Bible at all times and I don't ever get stuck. So then say that I do, I'm doing the Seeking God study. Then I, so I, I put Seeking God or I'll put, you know, Bible studies and then write number one, seeking God. And then right next to seeking God, I'll put Acts 17 verse 16. So I know exactly where to go. So then when I go to Acts 17 verse 16, it's circled. And then at the end of the reading, which is all the way to verse 28, at the end of that reading, then I put the next verse. So that way I know exactly what verse to go to next. Now it's okay. Like I used to be like, don't ever come to a Bible study with a sheet of paper and you're going to study the Bible with someone through a sheet of paper. I, I don't think that's the best way to do things. But listen, I mean, it's humble. Hey, I don't know these Bible studies. This is just a set of Bible studies that I went through. This is how our church, you know. So, I mean, I, I think it's okay to do that. Uh, you know, maybe use your phone, you know what I mean? And kind of scroll through as you go through. That's okay. But I love just opening my paper Bible. And I go right there. And I go right to that verse and it leads me to the next one after I get done with that, making those points. And then I go to the next one. I've seen people put the points inside, you know, on the side there to give them like three reminders of what the points are and just walk them through. Remember, we're, we're trying to be equipped, you know, we want to be better so and more efficient and we don't want to get um, our insecurities or you know, uh, clumsiness to get in the way of the connection. So we want to do the best that we can um, to, to make that connection. Okay. So, um, so if you go to the seeking God study and I told you how to get there, you don't have to open it. That's fine. Um, the first thing we want to do is what's the purpose of the study? Why are we sitting together and studying the Bible? Uh, you know, what, what are we doing here? Well, there's a couple different ways that you can present this. If, if it's someone that's a little hesitant, but they like our church, what I, a lot of times what I do is I said, hey, there's a, there's a set of studies that we go through and it just kind of gets you to help understand who we are. You know what I mean? And, and, and that's just true. Like, this is who we are. A lot of, all of us have kind of gone through these Bible studies. It'll give you a good idea of who we are. And sometimes that can be a good starter to sitting down with someone and studying the Bible. Uh, but also, you can also say, hey, you know, again, I'm a beggar. All I'm doing is I'm going to show you, show you where the bread at, bread's at. Someone else showed me where that was at. But it does depend on like where their heart is, how eager they are, how desperate they are. Some people come in, they just turn themselves in. Hey, I want to start studying the Bible because I want to become a Christian. Some people, they believe they're a Christian, you know, and, and so those discussions 
could look a little bit different. But however we do that, we also want to know what's the purpose of each study. So the Seeking God study is we want to teach a person, this is right up at the top of this Bible study, we want to teach a person how to pursue a relationship with God by developing a seeker's heart, a heart that is seeking God, and to come to know Jesus as revealed in God's word through the Bible. And you can just say that on your own words, you know, it's like, Hey, we're sitting down to show you what, what God sees as someone who's seeking him, not as what Matt thinks, but this is what the Bible believes what a seeker looks like. This is what God demands of someone who's going to seek him. And, uh, so we'll kind of jump in here and there's going to be a, a, a lot of illustrations that we're going to draw from, uh, to help you kind of understand some of these verses better. Remember, we're trying to get to the heart. So these illustrations, a lot of illustrations that I've used through the years have just been from the spirit of God. Like I didn't learn it from anyone. Sometimes I didn't, I'm sitting across someone and I, I understand what they do for a living, or I know that if they're a teenager, they run track or if they're, and I try to connect something in their life with the scripture to help them to make the connection. We don't just go through the scriptures and expect them to make their own connections. We want to help them to make connections. That was what's done for us. So we want to also do that for others. Jesus used parables. Um, prophets used stories. I mean, so we want to make sure that we are also dialed in to the need. Uh, so, so we go over to Acts chapter 17. And in verse 16, and in my Bible, it's circled in red, and I have a little outline. I guess you can kind of see it there. If I was with you in person, I would just show you. That's what the, the beginning of that looks like. So I know exactly where to go, and I know where to start. I just put this little square part over that edge. So I, I go right there, and there's no hesitation because I know exactly where I'm at. And, um, and I always like to read the first one. It's just... The way I am, I like to kick things off. And uh, verse 16, while Paul uh, was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who'd happen to be there. Now, verse 18 sometimes can be a tongue twister. So what I want to encourage you to do before you're studying the Bible with someone I would read through it a couple of times, make sure that you know how to pronounce some of these words. If you don't know how to pronounce a word, and I do it all the time, go over to BibleGateway.com and have the read, you could have the Bible read to you, have it read to you so that you can hear how it's pronounced. So that way you don't get stuck on some of these pronunciations. And before you know it, you've read through something and no one heard anything. So I do it. When I preach, I want to make sure that my reading doesn't get in the way of the point. So here we go. And I know a lot of us have a hard time with some of these words. Verse 18, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating for foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. A lot of times I stop there, and I, I want to paint them a picture. So I'll stop there and I'll say, you know, Back in these days, uh, what you had was Rome was the most powerful government in the world. And at that time, what they would do is they would take over different countries. And as they took over different countries, they would kill the people, but they would make sure that the idols weren't destroyed because they were afraid of, uh, of offending any gods. So they took all of these idols and Athens became kind of not a storage area, but kind of where they stored and they put the idols. So, and, and, and so Paul is walking through this area with all these idols and he's like, oh my goodness, look at all these idols, you know, all these people having these idols and all, you know, all of these, um, these different names to these idols. 
And he stands up in this meeting in verse 22. He says, people of Athens, I see that every way you're very religious. You don't want to step on anybody's toes. You want to understand all of these different religions. And I get it, you know. For as I walk around and I look carefully at your objects of worship, now you've kind of got a background, like all of the, you can imagine this, this town full of all of these idols, right? And, and, and altars. Because I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. <laughs> so like to, just in case we missed one. So they were so afraid, so superstitious, so religious that they were afraid. They didn't care about the killing of all the people and taking over all these countries. They were afraid to step on the toes of these gods. So they put an altar together, an idol that actually read to an unknown God, just in case. They didn't want to offend any of the gods. They want to make sure that all of their, their, their God, the God departments are covered. So, and this is, this is great. Got to listen to this. And this is how I read it. So, by the way, so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So really what, what Paul's saying, he's like, it's not that you're ignorant. You're an idiot. You're seeking. Your heart is empty. See how it connects with the Seeking God study? You're seeking. You're trying to find God. But you're looking at all of these different idols. You know, a fertility goddess. You're looking at all these, you know, Zeus and Apollos and Ra and all these different gods. And you want, and, and you're wondering why you just, you can't find it. You can't be successful at filling your heart in this hole that you have in your heart. And what Paul is saying is what you've been looking for, I'm going to tell you. And it's like this dead silence. You can hear a pin drop in verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it as the Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. In verse 26, and I also do that a lot too. If I'm reading a longer passage, I will, every once in a while, if I get a couple verses down, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that I tell them what verse we're on. I don't want to assume because some people are embarrassed and they won't say anything, but they're not actually reading along. So I don't want to assume that. I even do that when I'm preaching. So I would do that. I'll, I'll repeat verse 22 and verse 24. Okay, and now we're in verse 26. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he, see how I emphasize, he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. Why? Why did God do this? Well, look, in verse 27, God did this so that they would seek him, wow, and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. I mean, you can read the rest of this. For in him we live and move and we have our own, and we have our own, uh, our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Have you ever asked yourself, like, why am I here? That's what these philosophers, they would sit around and that that's all they would talk about. Why are we here? And it sounds like this mystical, what is it, existential, you know, this kind of outward thinking, you know, into the stars and into the ether. And they're trying to find these answers within a God, you know, within some God created by man or this idea of a God. But everyone does that. You're not alone. Everyone feels that same way. We feel the exact same way uh, about this subject that the people that Paul ran into. Because God loves us and he desires relationship with us, he's been actively putting us at the right place at the right time that we would find him. He put these guys at the right place at the right time so that they would find God this that day. What does that mean about you? A lot of what I will do right now is I if I have my glasses on, I will do one of these deals and I'll ask them, do you realize that what it took for you to sit here right now and to study the Bible with me. And maybe at that time you can share your story, you know, just a little bit about your story. Say, I, I remember, I, re I remember like it was yesterday when God got me. 
I remember like it was yesterday and I was sitting with this group of guys and I could not believe, I mean, I, I, I'm getting chills. I could not believe that I was sitting in front of someone and God had directed all my steps, all the places that I had lived, all of my past failures and mistakes and victories and all the relationships, the job changes, school, all of my, everything so that I could be sitting here right now studying the Bible. Do you know that you right now, it's not by chance that you came out to church, depending, you know, and you could, hopefully you know them a little bit and you could help them map this out. It's not by chance that your cubicle was next to mine and that you overheard me having that conversation. And then you asked me what church I went to and that you and I went out and had coffee. And then you, you invited me over for dinner and me, you and your wife had dinner and it was a great time. And then you find and you finally came out to church after the 30th time that I asked you, but then you bumped into Matt Kuchar and Matt asked you to go fishing. And then the, before you know it, we're on the boat fishing. And in that moment, I asked you to study the Bible and now we're sitting here studying the Bible. It's not coincidence. God did that. He put you at the right place at the right time so that you can reach out to him and perhaps, perhaps find him. So in some of, some of these questions are, are, they're more conversation starters. Understand like th these studies, if you just read through it, you're going to miss a lot of what I just said. You know, they're conversation starters. They're, they're more of like, what do you think, you know? And sometimes that some of that, what do you think is to the person who's actually leading the study, you know, like gives me an idea or give, it'll give you an idea of what to talk about. So we bring this up, you know, here's another question. Why do so many, so few seem to be seeking God today? You know, you can just ask him that. Why do you think there's so many, there's so few people actually seeking God? Um, so these are, these are great to talk around. To seek God, we must be willing to change our ideas about who God is to match what has been revealed to us in the Bible. And there's nothing more important or exciting in life than to seek and find our creator. You know, and you could, you could develop your own way to say that. And hopefully it'll be something personal. Like I'll never forget the day that I looked at these scriptures for the first time. It changed me. It changed my life. I've never been the same since. And I'm so excited for you. I'm so excited that you're taking this first step. And Paul, just like Paul was so excited, you know, for these, these, though they were just seeking and looking, uh, and even willing to worship these other idols because they're trying to fill this hole. You're going to find him. I know you are. So what is the first part of seeking God? Well, you got to know that God has been doing this your whole life putting you at the right place at the right time so that you would seek him and perhaps find him, okay? So then I would move on and I would say, you know what? Let's look at some more scriptures. All right, okay, so do, and then maybe even ask them, what do you think? And just let that person answer. Let that person tell, you know, and some, I've had, I've been in Bible studies that someone was broken and in and, and tears after this first verse, they're already turning themselves in because they're just like, you don't understand. I've been praying for this. I've been begging God to show me and you just, you know, open my heart. And, you know, so you might be surprised what you might find after just this one scripture and they just tell you their timeline and their story. It's a great opportunity, but you got to understand, you don't want to skip over this part. This is like, this is a heart connection. You don't want to just go, you know, and let's move on to another, another Bible study. No, this is, this is the foundation of the emotional connection uh, that they're beginning, this journey that they're beginning with God. So we're going to go ahead and now uh, uh, turn over to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. And, and I love to do little helps while I'm studying with people. Like a little hint, if you close your Bible and you open it into the middle you'll get pretty close to Jeremiah. Usually you'll get to about Isaiah. And then right after Isaiah is Jeremiah. Most people don't know where they're going in the Bible. I'm just saying, I didn't. I mean, I had no clue where I was going. I'll say things like that, like what I just told you when I'm in the middle of a study, because they'll feel a little insecure and say, dude, when I first started studying the Bible, they said turn to Genesis and I started flipping through the whole Bible. I didn't even know, I knew where nothing was. So don't feel bad. You've just not done this before. I'm just saying. 
you know, and that could become, uh, that could be someone that's very religious, that's been, gro they've grown up in church their whole life, but they've really never learned to go through the Bible and, and that's okay. So, uh, so they're just, you know, just ways of connection. So Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11 And typically what I would do if I don't really know them real well is, hey, do you feel comfortable reading the Bible? Why don't you give it a shot? You know, why don't you read this next one? Um, if, you know, and I want to also encourage us to not do this too much alone. It's always good to have a partner. Now, if, if you're at the office and you have an opportunity to open the word with somebody, psh, go for it. I'm not saying, I, I really want to encourage us not to wait until we get the other person. Um just go for it, you know. But if you if you have a planned study, it's always it, it is better to have someone there, and they could be taking notes, they could be giving you some input, they could share a little bit about their life, um, you know. So it will help the the study to go better. Uh, in you know anyway, so uh, chapter uh, twenty nine verse eleven, in Jeremiah it says, "For I know the plans I have for you," declares the Lord, "plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope." and a future. Then, okay, so you could do it in two ways. I, depending on who I'm with, sometimes I'll stop right there. And I'll, and I, I like to paint a background. It doesn't have to take a long time. You can tell them, Jeremiah, he's known as the weeping prophet. This guy, he had one message, 40, 50 years of preaching it, and no one responded. And God gave him some encouragements through his ministry. Here's one of the encouragements. It's a promise for the future. Actually, kind of like for us. One day, one day. But Jeremiah really never got to see this. So what he's reminding him is like, look, this is what the, all, the Almighty, the Lord God of Israel says to all those carried into exile. So they were in exile and let me tell you some. I was in exile, and I remember hearing this verse for the first time that I finally had some hope that God has a plan for me. And it's not a plan to trick me or to manipulate me or to get my money or no, he wants to prosper me and not to hurt me, not to harm me. And he wants me to have an awesome future. Sometimes that right there, you can ask someone like, what do you think about that? that God wants to prosper you and not to harm you, that he has plans for you. He wants a, he has a future for you. You know, right there could be a great discussion and then move on to verse 12. It says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. What do you think about that? And I love to ask that. What do you think about that? You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Sometimes that'll stump people because they're not used to reading the Bible. You know, and they're like, um, I'm not really sure. And so I, I like to walk people through it a little bit more. Like, okay, so you will seek me. So how are we going to find God? Are we going to do it part-time? So are we going to be able to find him part-time? Are we going to be able to find him if we just go to church on Sundays? part-time, spare time. What does it say there? Yeah, you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart, your whole heart. What does your whole heart mean? And I love to discuss that. Have you ever done anything with your whole heart? And that's, I think that's in there. Yeah. Um, have you done, have you ever done anything with your whole heart? And, you know, I typically study the Bible with guys, but we also study the Bible with couples and that's okay. But, you know, it's easy to connect guy to guy and girl to girl a lot of times. And I'll, if I know that, that, that guy played some sports or something like that, I'll ask him, you know, I know that you wrestled for six years. I mean, your fourth year of wrestling and that year that you won state, did you, do you feel like you gave your full attention and your full heart to the sport? Oh yeah. What were some of the things that you did? You know, so let them talk about their sport. Let them talk about, well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever sought God that way? And that's typically when like, whoa, you know what I mean? Like that's another level. Well, that's the only way we're going to find him. So think about all the people out there that don't seek him this way. Are they finding him? Think about your whole life. Have you ever sought God this way? 
No wonder why, you know, this went wrong in your life. No wonder why. I I mean, think about it. You, you've already shared this, 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 and this with me. You're on your fourth job. You're on the second marriage, whatever that might be. Uh, it, it's because you we just didn't give your full heart and your attention to God. See, he has plans for you. It's not to hurt you. It's not to, you know, he's not trying to pull the rug out from underneath you. He wants an amazing life for you, but you have to do your part. What's your part? That's right. Seeking God with your whole heart. And look at verse 14. Now here comes the good promises. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Do you realize how much God wants you back? See, we're not trying to help someone to gain knowledge here. We're trying to tap into their heart, the mushy part of their heart. The, that deafening silence is awesome when you ask these questions. What do you think about God right now? How badly do you think he desires you? He misses you. You know, and use their name. You know, he misses you, John. He misses you. He just wants to be with you. And But you have to do your part. Is this something that you want to do? Now, you could start asking the harder questions. Is this something that you want to do? You want, do, you, do you think that you're ready to seek God with all of your heart? And then some people are like, dude, that's, that's a big calling. I know. I'm telling you, I'll never forget the time where I, when, when someone asked me this question. And I'm like, I've got so much going on in my life. I've got, you know, 13 kids and I live in a shoe. I mean, you know, I don't know what the person's going to say, all these different things that they've got going on in their life. But don't you want to find God? Dude, this is going to have to be a priority. There's just no other way. You're not going to be able to find him. Do you see... We're only on the second scripture of seeking God and we're already at a place where you're helping someone to make a decision right here to follow God for the rest of their life. And we just started the Bible studies. You see how important it is to not skip over seeking God because this is it's so important to lay this foundation because you want to get these answers from them to help them to make these decisions that are solid and it'll help them to move forward. It'll help them to move forward through these Bible studies because they made that decision. Okay, John, you said you were going to seek God with all of your heart. You told me this two weeks ago. I remember we, we were in your office and you looked right at me and you had those tears in your eyes. I remember. And you said you were going to do this. Because you remember, this is the only way that you're going to find him. Do you really want to, do you want to find God? Yeah, yeah, I want to find God. Dude, I want, I'm going to be here with you. I'm not going to leave you. God's not going to set you. He's not setting you up. I know that you got a lot going on in your life, but the only way that you're going to find him is with all your heart. So I'm going to call you to this, dude. I'm calling you to the scriptures. You can do this. You see what I mean? You can draw from these scriptures to help someone to move on with their faith. Remember, we're just we're trying to help their heart. We're trying to massage that heart and get in there and help them to connect with God. Um, so sometimes uh, if, if it's like a first Bible study, right, and you are in the office or you're at a place where you don't have a lot of time, these two scriptures are perfect. You, you did a great kind of part one to seeking God. There's nothing wrong with going, dude, is this something that you'd like to do more of? Because there's a little bit more to this Bible study, but I see like we've already talked about a lot. Um, you know, maybe you and I, and I got a buddy, you know, Dusty, who's, you know, a good friend of mine. I'd love for you to meet him and maybe we can get together, the three of us, because we do this all the time and we can, the three of us can get together and study the Bible. Is that something that you'd be up for? You know, so you can kind of start thinking about maybe scheduling the next time together if you didn't have a lot of time. If you did have a lot of time, then definitely go ahead and move into the rest of the study. But those two scriptures are really kind of the basis of the Seeking God study. So first, you know, God, 
he put you at the right place at the right time for you to be here right now. This is your moment. This is your moment in time. And you could, you might be able to perhaps find him if you reach out for him. What does that look like? You got to do it with all of your heart. You can't do this part time. You can't just do this in your spare time. It's got to become important to you. Is that something that you want to do? And if it is, and you're still in this Bible study and you want to move on, then in my Bible right there, I want to show you what it looks like again. Look at that. Matthew 7, 7, right there. So I go to right, go to the next one. I don't need my Bible study sheet or anything like that. And I say, well, let's go ahead and turn to Matthew. Um, and I like to give little hints as I go. Matthew is the first gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those There's four gospels. Um, especially if they haven't really been through the Bible, not very knowledgeable. I like to teach the whole time, you know, even as we're turning and let them know that's the first book of the New Testament. Um, I don't get all theological or get too deep, you know, uh, but just to kind of get them an idea. Oh, okay. So the, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Oh, there's four gospels. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. All right. We're, so we're going to look over at Matthew chapter seven and verse seven. And you'll notice like this is a section of a big sermon that Jesus preaches. So this is all red letters. This is what literally Jesus's words. So how cool is that? So these are Jesus's words. And this, when I'm talking right now, don't think I'm talking to you. I'm talking to someone that we're studying with. Okay. So I want, I want you to catch on to some of the things that I say. Um, so you see, you know, he starts out in verse one, but he gets down here to verse seven and he's, he wants to make a point to us that he wants to make a point that if we do what we just talked about, Okay, if we do what we just talked about, look at verse seven. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Let me ask you a question. How hard is it to knock on a door? That's difficult, man. That's difficult. No, it's not. It's easy. You know, how, how hard is it to just ask for something? You ever look for your keys? It stinks, but it's not like, you know, you've got to break through a wall to be able to go and look for your keys. You just go around and look for your keys. What's cool is what Jesus is saying is, look, it's simple. It's simple. If you seek, you're going to find. Guaranteed. If you knock, door's going to be open to you, guaranteed. And everybody who asks receives, everybody. So dude, I know that you have been in prison for 40 years and I know that you, you know what I mean? Whatever bad situation that you find yourself in and whoever you're studying the Bible with, I know that you're on your fifth marriage or whatever it might be, you know what I mean? And you feel like it's life's over and you'll never have another chance. Actually, Jesus is saying, this is simple. It's simple. All you have to do is ask. So anybody could do this. And this is a great time to let them know anybody could do this. I know that you've got a lot against you, but Jesus is saying, it's not that hard. I promise you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. Okay, so let's just make sense of this. And that's what Jesus does, okay, in verse nine. So did you catch that? I don't just read through the whole thing. I wanna give them some meat, something to chew on. I wanna describe to them what the scriptures are saying. Um, I know that I'm filling in a lot of air, but because I want to continue on and I want to give you all of my nuggets, but I, but every, when I'm studying the Bible with someone, I will stop and I'll ask them, what do you think that says? What do you think that means? And most of the time, I mean, this is simple. We're going through a lot of simple studying. So most of the time they're pretty close. So then you got an opportunity to go, dude, exactly, exactly. That's exactly, you do. It's almost like you're a Bible scholar right now. I mean, you're, you know, to encourage them that they're on the right track, that they're getting the right answers. It's, it's, it's healthy to help them to feel, hey, I'm getting this. It, it opens their heart. Okay, yeah, I could do this. Yeah, of course you could do this. You totally exist. If you were there, you totally understand what Jesus said. Boom, drop the mic. Let's just move on to verse nine then because you already understand it. So I, I love doing things like that when I'm studying the Bible with someone. Verse nine says, which of you, if your son asks for bread? will give him a stone, duh. Or if he asks for fish, 
will give him a steak. No, that's ridiculous. If you then, though you are evil, let's go, remember, we're sinners. We can't get it right. So he assumes we're evil. We're, we're, we never, we're always messing up. We know how to get good gifts to your children. How much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So he's just kind of given us, he's making the point. God's perfect. He loves us. Remember, he's not trying to set you up. He's got plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. He's like, look, all you got to do is ask me. All you got to do is ask. <laughs> we have a perfect dad. He loves us. He's smitten. He's in love with us. He created us and he's proud of his creation. I mean, when I make something, I remember as a kid, I would make models and I would do, you know, I would put certain things together. I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard my kids were into Legos and man, when they finished up, uh, you know, following the instructions and they made this big fortress of Legos, they couldn't wait to show us. They were so proud. That's how God feels about you. He's so proud of what he made. I know that you feel like you've messed up. I know that you feel like you've blown it, but Jesus is like, dude, you're all evil. I like everybody's blown it. Nobody's perfect. So like, don't, don't think that way. God's going, all you got to do is ask me. You're my kid. I love you. I want you to have good. I want to hook you up. I want to take care of you. I'm not going to, if you let go and you just allow yourselves to ask me, I will give you, I'll give it to you. Just ask. Could you imagine your own child? They're hungry. And you say, Hey, I'm going to make you dinner. And instead of make, instead of putting a plate of food down, you give them a snake. Ah! You know what I mean? Could you imagine doing that to them? I, no, I, God doesn't, he would never do that to us. He's, it, this is not a trick. He doesn't want to, to scam us or pull the rug out from underneath our lives. He wants us to trust him, to seek him with all of our heart. And he's going, and when you do that, you just ask. See, we got to continue to go back to seeking. Remember, this is a seeking God study. So we got to always go back to the purpose of the study. The purpose is to show them what seeking God looks like. So seeking God here in this context is letting go, trusting that God wants good things for us. And as we let go, we can trust and he's going to take care of us. Because when we come to the, we come to the table, all of us can attest to this. We got baggage. We've got stuff going on in our life. And when we're told to let go and put God as the priority, we're like, Dude, you don't realize what I got going on. I can't just drop everything. I've got responsibilities. I've got, you know, other things going on in my life. I can't just walk away from them. So it takes a lot of faith. So we're helping the person that we're studying the Bible with to trust that God's going to take care of them as they let go of these things. And that's what a seeker looks like. Someone who trusts that God will take care of them because we have a loving father. This is also a time where you can talk about praying. You know, he replies to our prayers. How often do you pray? You know, and those are times where you can ask that question. When do you pray? I mean, I know that you pray when you get a speeding ticket. I know that you pray, you know, when, when you're in a fight with the spouse. I get that. But do you actually like pray, like consistently write out your prayers? You know, that's what my wife does. Or do you go on prayer walks? I mean, I love to go on prayer walks. You know what I mean? Like that's a time where you can start describing, do you like, do you pray? You know, do you know how to pray? So that's another opportunity to show them what a seeking God look like. What's well, a person who prays, a person who trusts God, you know? So anyway, so, so we can move on in the Bible study and the next, uh, you know, and this is in the set of studies that we have here. Uh, is Acts 8. So now you can do things like this, and I even do it from the pulpit a lot. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Now they know that you're, you know, that, that now they're with you. Acts chapter 8. And we're looking in verse 26. This is one of my favorite stories to read when I'm studying the Bible with someone. Most of the time they've heard of it if they've been to church or been to Sunday school, but they've never heard it this way. So just take, just know, they have never heard the story of the eunuch read with points like this. Um, and it's such an amazing story. 
Uh, I like to typically read this. So what I like to do is make sure that I'm the one who reads this one. So if you're going round robin, you might want to think about who's going to read what so that you can land on the the ones that you want to read. If you're leading the Bible study, the, you want to land on the ones that you want to read with some emphasis and that you do a good job walking them through some of these stories because that this is, it's a story, it's a narrative, you know? Um, so you want to think about that as you read through it. You don't want to clumsily fumble through it because when you do that, it's hard to stay focused. It's hard for that person to really grasp what the Bible was saying here. So verse 26, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch. Now you can all, if they've never heard this stuff before, you can say, hey, do you know what a eunuch is? That's always fun. Because then it shows you that it's like, oh man, this is crazy. Yeah, he's an important official in charge of the treasury of Candake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. But what a eunuch was, was, was someone that was devoted to God for their whole life. So devoted, they actually had, they got castrated. And that was a lot of times how the king would trust this person that would travel with his queen. Whoa. Yeah. So he was a devoted guy, first of all. All right. We know he's a devoted guy. So he's an Ethiopian. He's an important official and he's in charge of the treasury. Okay. So this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So he went to Jerusalem to worship God and on his way home. So now he's coming back. He's, he's sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. So what do you think he heard at the conference that he was at? Most likely they probably reading the scroll, reading from Isaiah. He owned a scroll, so he was wealthy enough or he was devoted enough, devoted really enough to actually have a copy of the scriptures, okay? Verse 29, the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. <clears throat> okay, so I love stopping in little parts. I love explaining what's going on the whole time. It's fun. It's exciting. And it keeps people at the edge of their seat. If they're not at the edge of their seat, I don't, I don't really think that we're doing a great job with the Bible reading. If they're sitting back and they're, <sighs> you know what I mean? And they're yawning. We've got to get a little bit maybe more energy or make sure that we're connecting a little bit more. But these are little opportunities. What's a chariot back then? That's a limo. All right. What's the treasury? The guy was like basically on the presidential staff. So think about this. There's this convoy of presidential staff limousines. God tells Philip to run up next to this limo. Now, Philip probably looks like a homeless guy and he comes up to this high official, the eunuch, and asks and overhears him reading, interrupts him and says, hey, do you know what you're reading? All right, so yes, exactly. That's exactly how I would feel. I'm sitting in a limo, I'm with the entourage and this homeless guy comes up and challenges me on my on my reading. And how, I mean, most limo windows would just go, right? Well, let's check this out. In verse 31, he goes, how can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip, the homeless guy, to come up and sit with him. It speaks a lot about this entourage, treasury, you know what I mean? Like this guy's third in charge of the kingdom. I don't know what he was, but he was high up there. And then he goes on. This passage of scripture, the eunuch was reading is verse 32. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and a lamb before the shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who could speak of his descendants for the life was taken from him on earth. So it's a prophecy about Jesus. All right. The eunuch just comes back from this conference. They talk about this. He still can't understand that it's pointing to something amazing. And then verse 34, the eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. So let's stop for a second. 
What does it say about the eunuch? And I, I love to let someone wrestle with that a little bit. This guy's in a limo. He's, he's high up there on the hierarchy of this kingdom of Ethiopia. He lets a homeless guy come in and teach him. You better believe it. He is seeking God. This heart, he's humble. He's teachable. He doesn't care what the guy looks like. He just knows that Philip has something, an answer that he does not have. So let me ask you a question. How many times do we just get prideful? We stop people from telling us what we need to hear or teach us something. So another thing that a seeker looks like is someone that's humble, that's teachable. That is someone that, you know, that has an open heart, that he may not know the answers. He's seeking, he's looking, right? He's reading on his own. He's trying to figure it out, but then he's also open enough to get the information. And I like to stop there too a lot of times and just go, dude, that's, that's all I'm doing to you. I'm a homeless guy. You're in your chariot and I'm just showing you what the scriptures mean. It's not, I'm not over you. You know what I mean? Like I'm, if anything, I'm under you, you're my boss or you're, you know, it, so it's an, also an opportunity to show them that they have your heart. You're seeking God right now and you didn't even know it. You're doing an awesome job, you know? So it's, it's an opportunity to encourage them here too, that you're, dude, you're just like the eunuch. Maybe this can be your theme scripture. You know, I mean, you just have this heart. You're like, hey, come show me what this stuff means. Now we're doing it and look what's happening. Your eyes are being opened. And that's kind of what happens here. Verse 36, we'll read to the end. As they traveled along the road, they came to water. Eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? That You know, if you want to get a little deeper, if it's someone that is likes to geek out on stuff, you can like say, what do you think that message was about then? Yeah, he was giving him instructions. He was giving him the gospel message. And that after that gospel message was finished and he gave him all the answers from, from the story of what happened to Jesus, he connects it to Isaiah. What does the eunuch say? Hey, pfft, I'm ready. I'm ready to turn my life in. Man, was he seeking God. This guy was desperate for God, you know. He gives the order to stop the chariot and Philip and the, Philip and the eunuch uh, go down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared to Azotus and traveled uh, 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 about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. You know, what an amazing example of what a seeker looks like. Um so he's already looking at the scriptures. He's already digging, trying to find the answers. He's teachable. He doesn't care really where this message comes from. Could be some homeless guy. He just wants the answer so that he can connect with God. That's what a seeker looks like. He's got this burning question that he wants to have these answers answered. And, um, and that's what I see in you. You know, I see that this, you know, you're a person that's really looking for this. And I just want to encourage you, you know, you're, you're, this it's hard it, this is it's the beginning of something great and that was the beginning of something great um there's other points that you could pull in here but that's pretty much what i cover and then uh again if someone's really understanding it i mean we, there's a couple more scriptures you don't necessarily have to finish every study oh if i don't finish the study they're, they're not going to become a christian that's not true i think there's some things in these next uh verses this th these next sections that are very important Acts 17 10 through 12 is in this study but it's also in another study as well so if you don't feel like talking about the Bereans right now that's okay if you're making this heart connection and they see what seeking God looks like and they want to man I want to seek God with all of my heart I, I you know I look forward to really this journey they got it you don't have to be redundant all the time make sure if we don't finish the study then I'm going to get in trouble with the, no it's not about the study it's about the heart so if their heart connects, that's what you're aiming at. Sometimes, I mean, I've been in studies doing seeking God and someone's just broken. They're confessing their sin already. I don't want to stop them and say, hey, wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. You're talking too much. We got to finish this study. You know what I mean? I've completely missed the point. I'm not using the study to finish the study. I'm using the study to help their heart connect with God. If they're connecting with God, then sometimes that's enough. You know, maybe, maybe they're like, I've never prayed. 
you know, well, why don't we pray together right now? You know, I mean, that's what a seeker looks like is someone who's praying. Let's go ask, let's ask God together right now for some answers. I've never read the Bible before. I don't even know what it means to be the eunuch. Dude, let's stop right now and I want to, let's make some decisions on what we're going to read together. So maybe it's time to stop and let's start seeking God. Does that, hopefully that all makes sense. But the goal is not to process someone through a set of studies. The goal is to get to the heart, to help them to become a disciple of Jesus. Now, there also be, can be some coldness right now. And they're like, that's kind of cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's kind of neat. Yeah, okay. You don't berate them with more scriptures. Okay. So it's also a time where you might want to go, you know what? This may not be the best setting. Maybe I thought they would love Starbucks, but they can't listen to me. And all they're hearing is wah, 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 wah. That's a great time to stop because what's going to happen is you're going to mow through these scriptures. They're not going to have been listened to them or been affected by them. And now what do you do? You're going to have to go back over the same scriptures that you went through so that they understand what it looks like to seek God. So we want to be very sensitive, keyed in to how someone's doing through these Bible studies. If you're aloof and you're just processing someone through Bible studies, you are not, you're doing them a disservice. Um, we're, we want to be the mouthpiece of God. We want to let the spirit work through us. And how we do that is we've got to get laser focused. And if it's in a place where they can't focus or if they're in a place where they can't focus, kids are running around or whatever, maybe it's good to just do two scriptures. And that's enough. I mean, I've studied the Bible. I studied the Bible with a couple people where all they can handle was a couple scriptures at a time. And it took us a while to get through the Bible studies, but I wanted to make sure that they got them all. You know, I, I'm sorry, that they, that, not that they got all the scriptures, but they got all of the points, you know, that they understood fully what they were getting themselves into, what it really looks like to seek God. Because if you don't do that, next time you get together, they're, they're not even going to remember it. Um, so just be careful. We've gone deep into this Bible study. If you're not attentive and, and, and zeroing in on their responses, then you're kind of moving, you're trying to push someone through this Bible study. And that's not why we have the set of Bible studies is to get someone through this set of Bible studies is to reach the heart. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, at this time, I'm just going to really quick see if uh, I don't think I got any direct. I cannot see you. So if you're raising your hand or whatever, I just did not. I have not gotten any uh, responses or, or whatever they call it, texts or something. So just want to double check and make sure if you have any questions or, or anything. I just want to encourage you to go ahead and send me send me something if it's something that you're curious about or we can cover that. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Deb. Um, great. Well, now that I see that it's working, thank you for doing that, Deb. Um, so, amen. So, Sometimes you'll be tired. You'll feel that it's enough. That's okay. Say, dude, I'm. this was awesome. You know, do you mind if we close in a prayer? Or is there any other questions that you have right now, you know, about the Bible studies that, you know, or anything that you're wondering about or anything that we've talked about? Um, but you definitely want to close it out with seeking, right? You want to reiterate seeking God and making sure that this is about God seeking and you know a relationship with God and we're looking at the Bible to give us what seeking God looks like so we're not not processing someone we're not pushing them through uh, a set of studies uh, should we let them know up front okay great uh, should we let them know up front that there's more studies in the beginning what to expect yeah that's great point um, typically I think I love to say that there's a set of studies that we go through both to show you what we're all about here in Southwest Florida, you know, uh, in this church. And, you know, we're looking to see what the Bible says about becoming a Christian. So kind of step one is what does it look like to seek God? 
you know, and that's kind of, no, that's step one, you know, and, and this is going to be something that we gravitate back to a lot as we go through our, you know, through Bible studies. So that's a good, that's a good point. And I, and I do love to let people know that there's, there's, you know, this is just step one uh, of, you know, a set of studies that we go through, you know, uh, you know, in a biblical approach to what a Christian looks like or how, how, how you become a Christian, what the Bible teaches about what a Christian is. If they're religious, you know, a lot of times you'll end up at, well, what are you saying about me? You know, um, so I think that's a great time to back off a little bit because we're just doing the seeking God study and say, look, this is not about me. We're just looking at what the word says about this. And, um, so it's not, it's definitely not a, a point where you want to move forward with like, well, let me show you what a Christian is. Let's jump into discipleship, you know, or whatever. I would hold off on that and say, well, why don't we look and see? Yeah. I mean, the Berean thing is really good. Um, that's why I moved it into this study. Uh, so why, why don't we look over there and we'll make some points there. So that's over in Acts 17. And again, that would be in, that's in my Bible, right after Acts 8, 26 through 40, verse 10 through 12, in chapter 17, I have two little notations there. Um, one is the word and the other one is seeking God because the word will take you in one direction within this set of Bible studies, the seeking God study will take you in another direction. So if you're writing it in your Bible, make sure that you, well, this is how I have it in my Bible. So you can see it. So I'll, I'll have word, you see what I mean? And then the seeking God SG will send you at a different, that's John one. You see what I mean? So it takes you in a different, different direction. So, uh, so yeah, so, uh, so what we're looking at is uh, Acts 17 and verse 10. And by now you've kind of gotten in, you're deeper into a Bible study. You're seeing their response. You're, 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 you're taking in uh, their answers. Hopefully by now you're getting to know them a little bit better. Now you're around the Bible and you're seeing uh, their attentiveness to the word of God. And in verse 10, um, it, it, you know, in Berea, and I, a lot of us know this, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. So I love to say that same thing. So what do you, what do you think about that? Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's great. Um, so, but there's a difference between those in Thessalonica, which was the city that Paul came from before he came to Berea. Now, in Thessalonica, at first, they loved the message, but then the Jews stirred up some action uh, with within those who were hearing the message, and they chased Paul out of town. Now, in Berea, it was a little bit different. What's the difference there? Well, once he gets there, he goes to the Jewish synagogue, as, as he did when he came into any town. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character. What does God see as noble character? Well, they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now, I don't get on the theological side of checking what people say on, remember, we're thinking about seeking God. So what about seeking God do we see? Well, first of all, they were eager to hear the message. So you can make a point here. Um, yeah, I noticed that you come to church every once in a while. I love having you. It's great, but you don't come consistently. You know what I mean? What does eager look like? Yeah, every Sunday. That'd be awesome. I think it'd be a great idea for you to come every Sunday. How about men's midweek? Right, exactly. So they were going on Sundays and midweeks. That's that's what the Bereans were doing. You know what I mean? That was their heart. They wanted to, they were eager. Okay. And then what else did they do? Well, they examined the scriptures every day. So they also were not just eager to show up. 
but they also were eager to read, you know, they, to get into the scriptures, to, to, to take time with God. So they, and, and have you ever taken an exam? I mean, you, you can use this illustration. I use it all the time. When you take an exam, that's worth a lot of points in, in your class, whether it's in college or high school, what do you do before you take this exam? Well, you study for it, right? Well, that's what an examination looks like, examining something. So you study it. You don't just read over it, but you study it. That's what they were doing with the scriptures. They were, they were studying the scriptures, studying what Paul said. They were studying this out and they were also examining. So how do you examine something? How do you look into something to see if it's true? Yeah, you, you test it. How do you test scriptures? These are leading questions, but you can help someone to get there. How do you test a scripture? How do you test a Bible verse? Yeah, you apply it to your life. Exactly. You test it out. You check it out to see if it's true. So what did they do every day? Well, they were eager. They showed up, but they also took what they learned and they applied it to see if it was true. They tested it. They put it into their life. That's the challenge. That's what a seeker looks like. Someone who's seeking God is not only, they, they, they definitely want to be there on Sundays. They want to definitely be there on Wednesdays. And that's going to be really important. But also what you hear and what you're learning here is what you're going to also put into practice. So how often do they do this? Well, just look back there. Let's read it again. So I'll do that because people get lost and they'll, they'll be looking all over there. They're not exactly sure what you're aiming at anymore. So you're going to have to guide them a little bit. Don't make them. I, I, I've been in Bible studies where it makes the person feel stupid and that's not the goal. They've never read this stuff before. And it's exactly how you were the first time. So we've got to be sensitive to that for they receive the message with great eagerness and examine the scriptures what does it say there? Exactly. Every day. Every day. So what does a seeker look like? You know, and that's what the result. Yeah. You know, Christians, right? But first, you've got to seek in a biblical way. So this could be a great wrap up or you can finish the study off if you want. But I, I love to wrap up, you know, around now. Uh, John 1, 1 through 18, Jesus has made God known. That's a great thing that maybe if you guys read John together, you can give them some of these highlights. John 20, 30 through 31, word of God produces faith in Jesus. It's actually a really good one. Um, so if you want more faith in Jesus and you can read through this with them, um, how does, how does, how do you gain faith in Jesus? Well, the word of God produces. So you can help them to see that reading the Bible is not just examining it, becoming a better person. This is actually going to help you to build your faith. So if you're not in your word, you're not eager, you're not showing up, you're not, you know, then. So let's go, let, let's go through this again real quick before, before we're done here. You know, we started off saying that God put you at the right place at the right time. It is not by chance that you're here. God meant you to meant for you to be here. He meant for us to work together and he, he meant for us to be neighbors. He meant for me to walk in there uh, at Publix and invite you out to church. He meant for that to happen. He set me up. He set you up. It was a big setup. You know, Jeremiah 29. Yeah. I mean, and his plan is not to trick you or to manipulate you or to get your money or whatever. No, he wants to prosper you, not to harm you. He's got plans for you. And that's to have hope in a future. That's what God wants for you. You know, and then we went over to Matthew 7. He's like, it's not hard. All you gotta do is ask me. You're my child. I created you. I'm so proud of you. You're why? What? What kind of dad would God be if you asked him? If you're praying right now, or you're asking him to lead you in the right direction, and it's a big trick. He doesn't do that. You can trust that God's got His best intention for you. You know. Act, then we went on to Acts eight. You know, and we saw that the eunuch, right? And, and what is, what was, what stood out about the eunuch? He was humble. He was teachable. He was already examining the scriptures. Remember, we just talked about that. He was doing that. He was examining the scriptures. And, and then he was open to getting that 
teaching, even from a homeless guy. And this guy's riding around in a limo, you know? So just reminding, you know what I mean? We're, we're, we're hitting those little, those little points again, you know? And then what made the Bereans so noble? Yeah, they were eager. You know, they came to church. They, they, you know, they made it a point. They made it important. You know, going back to Jeremiah 29, uh, you know, you're not going to find this half-heartedly. You're not going to find God if you're just, you know, weekend, you know, just the weekends is when you focus on God or, you know, a holiday churchgoer. It's not going to happen. You're never going to, you're not going to find God that way. It's got to become a priority, you know, and then you can just kind of walk through, uh, you know, if you covered anything else to kind of button up. And um, so, and, and it's really great a lot of times to kind of see where they're at is to pray with them. So to kind of say, hey, let's go ahead and um, let's, you know, let's, let's close out this study with a prayer. You know, why, why don't you, why don't you start us out and then I'll finish. And then you can see kind of what their prayer life is like, um, how they talk to God. I've heard some of the most humble prayers that were the most uneducated, unchurched people because they just go, God, I want to seek you. I don't know what the answers are. I'm so grateful for my buddy, Matt. And I don't know what it's going to mean for me, but I really want to seek you. And I just pray that, you know, I mean, sometimes you'll hear these things. And you're going, dude, that guy totally got it. Or you'll hear him say this, Father be in heaven, hallowed be my name, my kingdom come, I will be done. You're like, all right, we got, we got some work to do with the religious side. You know, so you can hear, you can kind of hear what's going on. Overflow of the heart speaks to mouth. You can kind of hear what is going on there. If they've connected with the study, if they've really gotten what you said. Um, and I, and this is also a great time. Like if you have a note taker with you that no one gets notes taken from them, they don't. And it's great to like, you know, if Matt's with me or Dusty or whatever, I mean, it's just great to go, here's the notes that I took for you, you know? And they're like, Whoa, all right. Thanks, man. You know? So here's your homework. You know, uh, we're going to go ahead and why don't we read now? My favorite gospel is Mark. I know a lot of you guys have been kind of programmed to do John. That's fine. There's no wrong way. I want you also to be cognizant. Who are you studying with? Okay. What gospel would be the best for them? Not for you, for them. Okay. So what I found is Mark is a lot of action. It doesn't have a lot of theology. Um, so it's kind of been my go-to lately. I don't know why. John is not a synoptic gospel. So it is a little bit different than the other three. Uh, it, John is older. He's reflecting. It does show a lot of Jesus, but there's a lot of mystical stuff in the beginning that could be confusing and people could get stuck. So, uh, but if they're versed in, in they're kind of churched, then maybe you could say, hey, what's your favorite gospel? Well, why don't we read it together? That shows the commitment that you have to them. And now you're calling them to be committed to you. Because now they're going to go, ooh, if I don't read and Matt's reading, I don't want him to waste his time. So I, I got to make sure that I stay up with this. And how, how much do you read? Again, you want to be cognizant of who you're studying with. You know, um, if they're if they had a hard time reading, when you had them read and they're not great readers, then maybe you want to say, hey, why don't you do a chapter a day? If they're like, you know what I mean? And they're like motoring through it and they've, oh, I've read John 12 times and I read Matthew 14, you know, and they've kind of been around the Bible a little bit. You say, hey, by the end of the week, when we get back together, I challenge you, why don't you have finished John? Me and you we will do it. You know, so you just want to read who they are. You want to give them enough to chew on to challenge them because you want to call them to be a seeker and not this be in their spare time, that it becomes a priority to them. That you want to help them to be a Berean. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to give them more than they can choose. So that's up to you, right? That's up to us to read the person that we're studying with. It's important that we connect. Um, age appropriateness. Yeah, it's important too. Illustrations that you draw are really important to make sure that they're age appropriate. If I'm studying the Bible with a teenager, my, my illustrations are going to be all teenager driven. I'm not going to pull in one of my old illustrations that I pull in for us from a sermon. I'm going to try to connect them with something that's happening now. 
you know, what's, what's going on in their life now. If they're into sports, I want to make sure that I know about that so that I can draw some illustrations in. You know, I'm going to say, hey, look, you call yourself a Christian. So what if I call myself the center starter of your high school team? Now I'm short and I'm five, seven and a half and three quarters, but I just call myself, I, nope, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a high school center and I'm going to play for your team. Yeah. I'm 50 years old, but I'm going to play. I, I'm a player on your team. It sounds ridiculous, right? Cause I, first of all, I'm not tall enough. Secondly, I haven't been practicing with you. Thirdly, I'm 50 years old and I don't belong in high school anymore. You see what I'm saying? So you call yourself a Berean, but you don't read your Bible. You don't know how to pray. I'm not saying that you smush them with that, but that's the illustration you draw. You don't draw an illustration that has to do with some older book that you read or a song that's not current, you know, and then you have to explain the song and you got to explain the book and then now you're all disconnected. So now if they're older, you also want to be cognizant of that. You know what I mean? So say that they were, they're, they're 60 or 70 years old. You want to make sure that those illustrations have to do with their time. You know, I'm 50, so I don't remember music, but I can bring up a couple. I can talk about Elvis, you know what I mean? I can talk about in the old days, you know what I mean? I can say things like that. Well, I remember, you know, hey, can you remember what your parents went through with the Great Depression? No, oh, yeah, I remember the Great Depression. Yeah, I mean, they were eager, right? Yeah, they were eager. They had to make a dollar. They didn't have a choice. That's the eagerness that I'm calling you to. You see what I mean? Like we want to use these illustrations and make sure that they're relevant to that person. It's not about us. It's about them. And how are we going to help them to have a comfortable setting? How are we going to draw illustrations that match their lifestyle and their life? And how are we going to get this these scriptures inserted into their heart? Uh, you know, again, we want to challenge them before we leave. We want to make sure that we pray. Uh, here's something that is becoming a pet peeve of mine, and we'll close out with this, that the only time that you get together is to study the Bible. That, guys, that's not loving. That is not becoming a friend. And we need partners. And and to, to build a partnership is not just Bible studies. The partnership happens outside of these Bible studies to go grab coffee, go talk about, go see a movie together. You know, you find out what they're about. What do they like, you know, and, and you try to do that and, and maybe figure out, you know, how you can get into their life or, or, or do something that, that would, you know, would, would help them to feel special. Um, you know, uh, so I just want to challenge all of us to be more thoughtful of that. It takes a lot of work and time and effort to help someone to become a Christian. Listen, uh, any, any women that have had babies in here? It takes, it takes a lot of work to birth a baby. It takes nine months in the oven and then terror for a couple hours up to 30 some hours of getting that baby out. And then you don't just say, hey, bye. Go oh, hope the baby does good on their own. No, it's, it's an investment. You've given your life for this baby. And now you're going to make sure this baby becomes mature. I mean, you know what I mean? It's, it's a, it's a long-term investment when we're sitting together with someone and we're studying the Bible with them. It's a commitment. And you're in, in, in as much as listen to this and I just maybe write this down or just burn it into your head. As much as you're telling them to be committed to you, you need to be committed to them. You're telling them to come on Sundays and Wednesdays and commit their life to your lifestyle. You, you're, you're, we're going to need to commit the same amount of energy and, and heart to them as well. We're going to win them over to Christ to help them to have a relationship with Jesus we, we've got to give our full heart and attention. And so we may not be able to be in five different Bible studies. We may not be able to be, you know what I mean? We may have to go, you know what? I got to cut some of these other things out because I got to help John to become a Christian. And that's going to be my focus. So you, we might have to say no to some other things. We may have to prep, prepare before we get into these Bible studies. Um, I, I've, I, I've gotten to the point where I don't have to prepare. You need to be there one day, but I know that it, it took me years to get there, years of studying the Bible with people to get to the point where I didn't have to make sure I knew where the studies were going to go. And you know what I mean? And, and, and I, you know, to make sure that I understood every point and I understood that it, it takes time and effort. So you're also going to have to 
put some planning time together as well. You wing it, they're going to know it. And it doesn't show love. And it doesn't show eagerness and care. And then you're going to call them at the end of this study to do something that you're not doing. You see what I mean? So it's important that we're giving our full heart when we get into these Bible studies. That's preparation. That's engagement. That's follow-up. And that's helping someone. But I promise you, in the end, when you are holding this person and you're helping them into the waters of baptism, it'll all be worth it. You're going to look back and you're going to go, wow, I'm so grateful that we didn't cut any corners, that we did what was right, that I committed myself to this person. And it's not only just a person who got baptized, they become one of my new best friends for life. And um, so hopefully that was helpful. Uh, I know that was a lot for a Seeking God study, but can you imagine that is the foundation, you know, that we need to be ready to lay uh, when we get into these Bible studies. And God will definitely be pleased. I'll tell you right now, he'll be pleased that we are so immersed in making sure just completely consumed with helping someone to understand him and his word. So, yeah. So anyway, um, I welcome any input, feedback, but it's not going to be now. I'm going to let everyone go. Uh, so send me emails, um, send me feedback and, um, and our, our times together will typically be about an hour and a half. So just kind of plan for that in the future as well. So I love you guys, uh, enjoyed it. And I will probably see some of you guys, uh, in a, in about, and well, in about an hour and change for Saturday night service. Love you. Have a great, have a great day. Have a good night.